Hi everybody and welcome in. My guest today is going to be Courtney Swan. Um, while I work on getting her into the room, I would love to hear from everybody where you're joining us from, but also what you've enjoyed, what seasonal food you've been enjoying eating. So we're in the middle of summer's bounty. Is it something you're eating now or is it something you're looking forward to um, in a future season? So I would love to hear those responses. It's about lunchtime over here. So I can't wait to see what people are having. Oh, we're good. Hi. Yay. How are you, Courtney? Good. How are you? Very good. Um, good. So you didn't get to hear a question, so I'm going to put you on the spot. But I asked people what seasonal food they're enjoying. And I know you recently moved to Colorado. So I would love to hear what have you found that's delicious in Colorado? Oh, I'm loving the pizza peaches right now. I'm just living for peach season. I just went to the farmer's market last uh, Sunday and I got a bunch of peaches and I've just been eating them all week and oh, they're the best. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Oh, that's my summer classic. There's nothing like peaches in the summer. I know. I agree. What about you? Oh, that's a good question. So I've been California, so Southern California. So there's kind of great seasonal stuff year round. We just finished up strawberry season though. And a strawberry in season is just like candy for the soul. So we plowed through those, but it's over already. It's oh, amazing. It goes in the blink of an eye. Um, so I'm a little sad about that, but we made strawberry muffins and my son wanted a strawberry cake for his birthday and strawberry oh. ice cream. So I am strawberried out, but it was a wonderful <laughs> five or six weeks. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, oh, someone said ice cream. Um, Eating uh, ice cream every day will cause dementia. Um, I would argue if you're eating real ice cream and real ice cream is just really simple cream, um, a little, I would say do a little bit of sugar in there, not a ton. Egg yolks, um, I'm missing something. It's very simple. You can look up your own recipe online. I would not argue that that would be something that would be leading to dementia. Now, if you go back and watch one of my videos I did recently and what they're now calling ice cream, um, like this box of ice cream sandwiches that I had in one of my videos, it literally says on the front, they stamped it and said made with real ice cream. And I left it out on my kitchen counter for three days and it didn't melt. Oh, that's it, scary. It changed colors too. It came out of the freezer white and then after like five or six hours, it turned to this weird like yellow color. Like it kind of looked like margarine and all these people in the comments were like, oh, you faked this, you put margarine here. I was like, no, I, it's just been sitting on my counter for three days. Right. Sometimes so. you don't even have to fake stuff like that. It's just real things that are happening in yes. conservatives and things like that. Yeah, um, yeah. so I'm, I would argue maybe if you're eating ultra processed ice cream, yeah, it's gonna cause a lot of issues to your brain, but. yeah. Yeah, and so I was surprised when I first started doing it how simple it is to make real ice cream. So it, I, I thought it would be really complicated, but we have an ice cream maker and it's been really fun. So it's nice to kind of enjoy stuff like that because you, you feel like you control what goes into it. You know how much sugar goes in. Um, and so it's been fun to do personally, but also as a family. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I love that. I just got an attachment. If anybody has a KitchenAid mixer, which I've had for like 10 years, I feel like it's a kitchen staple. I just got an attachment that's going to let me make ice cream with it. I haven't opened it yet, but I'm so excited. Well, I can't wait to hear back. Um, and so let me just tell people where they can find that information from you. So um, if you don't already know her, um, we've got Courtney Swan on today. Um, she's developed an incredible social media following um, at Real Foodology, where she works to educate people just like she is now um, about real foods and the organic foods movement, really tries to kind of help people stay healthy and um, be at their best by incorporating real foods into their diet. Um, she, as we talked about, has recently moved to Colorado and that's where she hosts her podcast, Real Foodology. Um, and you can catch weekly episodes on there that also um, go into more detail on some of this stuff. So we're super excited to have Courtney and um, kind of pick her brain for the next 25 minutes or so. Yeah, um, and my name is Vanessa Clark. I'm a life force clinician and registered dietitian. And um, so we're looking forward to having Courtney on and working with her in the future to, to kind of bring some of this information to you guys. Um, I do want to give one, one quick heads up. Um, <clears throat> we are going to try to leave some time for questions at the end. I'm sure Courtney and I can nerd out on this stuff all day, but we are going to try to stay in a time limit. And we really want to hear from you guys. So please drop questions in the bottom and we will leave some time for that at the very end. Um, so getting into it a little more, <clears throat> um, Courtney, tell us a little bit about real foodology and kind of this idea of what it means to be a real foodist. What does that mean to you? 
Yeah, so I created Real Foodology and I came up with the name back in 2011 when I was getting my master's in nutrition. And the reason that I named it Real Foodology is because I was, I was sitting with it for weeks and I was thinking, okay, what is something that I feel like will always be the cornerstone of my message? And that's real food. And so that's where I came up with the name Real Foodology. And then I just started calling myself a real foodist, meaning that I don't adhere to any sort of like diet label or anything like that, except for gluten-free because I was diagnosed like 15 years ago with a wheat allergy. So I have to eat gluten-free. But outside of that, what that really means to me being a real foodist just means that I just focus on eating real food. So to me, um, I don't live by any sort of diet label. I don't have any foods that are restrictions um, except for ultra processed foods, but we'll talk about that later because I don't consider those food. So for me, anything that's real food, um, fruits, vegetables, animal proteins, legumes, grains, like it's all on the table for me, barring any sort of allergies in, in my case would be gluten. Mm -hmm. um, I like the simplicity of that and also the inclusiveness. I think sometimes in nutrition, maybe you can identify this too, we get very exclusive take this out, remove this, blah, blah, And I think it gets really confusing for people and harder to adhere to. And so I think when it's an inclusive mindset, like what are you putting on your table and what are the options open to you? And the simplicity of like, if it's in a whole intact form, it's probably okay to have in your diet. Exactly. Um, and so I like the way the simplicity and also just the, the way that we approach food as more of a positive structure than a negative removing structure. So I love that. Um, and while we're in the business of defining terms, um, as you know, the wellness world loves a good buzzword. So there's lots of those out there. So we've been hearing a lot about functional health and integrative health and more specifically integrative nutrition. So I'm curious to hear how you kind of define those and how you talk to your community about that and, and what those really mean and how it might be different than kind of traditional forms of health and nutrition. Yeah, so integrative just means that it's taking more of a root cause approach and is focused on more prevention and treats person a person from their whole lifestyle versus just like singling out symptoms. Um, in the allopathic world and the traditional way that we've done things, there's kind of this like, okay, we're going to treat a person just for one symptom instead of looking at their whole body. So it really what it means is that we're integrated, we're integrating conventional approaches with some complementary therapies. Um, and so instead of just focusing on someone's symptom, which is a very important thing, we're looking at somebody's entire lifestyle, right? Um, spirituality components, what does your social life look like? What does your sleep look like? What does your diet look like? And it's integrated, integrating all of this because it's all about um, your health as a whole and not just like this one symptom or you just being defined by, um, yeah, if you have this one symptom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that it takes that whole person approach. I think we've really learned that there is no one size fits all. And the more that we learn about um, deeper dives into things like genetics or epigenetics and microbiome, I think we just realize we're all such complex organisms and we don't exist outside of that social and cultural and kind of socioeconomic relationship with the world. So um, I'm glad that people are finally kind of turning an eye towards this um, and paying attention because you can't really treat just the symptom or the number without the person behind it. So. Um, personalization is so important. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad we're hearing yeah. more about it. There are some buzzwords that are less helpful than others, but um, I love that we're hearing more about integrative health and nutrition recently. Me too. Well, and I think it's so incredibly important because people are starting to wake up that even though, um, you know, all of our bodies work very similarly, we're still also bio-individualized. You know, it's dependent on our genetic makeup and certain things. I mean, just for example, something that works really well for me may not work for somebody else, may not work for you really well, or it might, but it's all about figuring out what your own body's needs are. And that personalization um, is incredibly important. And I think people are really starting to wake up to it and realizing how important it is. And it's why I love Life Force so, so much. Yeah. 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 I think Life Force really kind of takes that personalization to the heart and puts it at the, the center of our kind of relationship and, and um, the entire purpose of the company. Um, Life Force is a little bit unique in that we obviously, um, as a member, somebody gets 50 plus um, biomarkers checked every three months. And so we have a lot of data on a person. But in addition to just the numbers, we also ask a lot of questions. Life Force loves a good questionnaire. Um, and people do them before the visit, um, the initial, and then at each follow-up, a more abbreviated one, because really, 
the numbers aren't maybe meaningless, but they're much more meaningful when you know the person behind the numbers. We have to get to know um, the, the history of somebody, their habits, the context that those numbers have been developed in, and also where we want to go, right? Um, somebody's goals are just as important in kind of determining their, their um, kind of priorities. Uh, just as important as the numbers. So we really have to get that background to really kind of work with somebody to achieve not just wellness, but really peak and optimal performance. Um, and then they also get clinician visits and 30 minute clinician visits three or four times a year, um, every quarter. So it's much more time with somebody um, than yeah. in traditional healthcare. And then also a health coach. I always tell people that life force is definitely a team sport and you really need that personalized support um, not just creating the, the priorities with the clinician, but then also how do we follow through on that? I think that's such an important piece. We, we are community members and we're meant to kind of exist in that community and we need that support. So I always tell people it's a little bit like planning a road trip. Like first you have to know where you're going to get. Like it's a different place, way to get to grandma's house or Auntie Jess's house or to your best friend's house. So you have to know where we're going. Do you want to hike Kilimanjaro? Do you just want to be able to get on the ground and play with your grandkids? Um, do you want to open up a business? Like what's your, what are your goals? Um, and then we have to kind of plan the ways there. So the roads to get there, like our habits, some of them are really well formed. Some are kind of dirt roads that need a little bit of help. Some of them need a little bit of just improvement. And so, and then those biomarkers are kind of like the ways things that get in the way. So is there a police car on your road? Is there a traffic jam? But what tells us what, what your strengths are and what obstacles or roadblocks might get in the way. So it really helps us to kind of guide all of those things so we can map out somebody's future um, because we have to know what those strengths and weaknesses are so we can plan on where we're getting. So it's been a, a really kind of fun opportunity to get to know more about people's health and be a part of their journey. You know, and I was telling them, I'm just one of the backseat drivers, right? The person, just like you said, has to be the driver, what works for their body, what works for their culture, what works for their lifestyle. So um, yeah. it's really revolutionizing kind of that healthcare landscape um, to kind of take to the next level for people. So they really are thriving rather than just kind of surviving. Yeah, and it's really incredibly important to have blood work so that you can see <laughs> Uh, where you started and then where you're heading. And it's really helpful to see like, okay, if I'm implementing all these diet and lifestyle changes and my numbers are you know, going in the direction that we want to go, then it's going to encourage the person to continue on with those lifestyle changes. And also it can help with things like, for example, if you are pre-diabetic and you can start lowering those numbers with diet and lifestyle changes, what an amazing shift that you can make in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, so many people are really tired of this pill for every ill system that we have set up right now. And I know everyone probably listening knows what it feels like to go into a doctor's office and have about five minutes with them. They have no context on your life whatsoever. They hear that you have one symptom. They just match that symptom with a pill. And this is not to vilify doctors at all. I think doctors are, um, they're one, they're trained to do it like this. And also they don't have a lot of time with the patients because the whole system is set up that way. So that's what's so amazing about changing the whole system. Like you said, is that we get a lot of time with a clinician. We also have blood work to look at so we can see where we're headed and how we can make the lifestyle changes. And then it's bio-individualized because instead of me just sitting down with my doctor for five minutes and going, oh, well, I have this and that symptom. And then maybe I forget to list off a couple things. Well, I can actually sit down with someone like yourself and you can look at all my blood work and be like, oh, are you feeling a little fatigued? I feel like I can see it in your blood work. And then we can work on that. And it really gives somebody actionable uh, tools that they can do to change their life and actually, like you said, thrive instead of just survive. Yeah. And so I'm curious about that is because about your life force experience specifically, because um, I think sometimes we think that people who have some expertise in this area don't need help. And, um, you know, what was your experience like going through the life force process? Was there anything that surprised you or that, you know, you got extra information on? Because um, I think it's always nice to hear from somebody who's in the field who also kind of has been through the process and, and gotten that support. Yeah, I was trying to remember like individual things that I saw in my blood work. The thing that just really helps me the most is like you said, a lot of people um, who work in my world, yeah, like we feel like maybe we don't need to go as often just because I'm like, okay, I have a lot of this in my brain already. And I, I feel like I have my lifestyle and my diet pretty dialed in, but it was interesting to see my numbers and be like, oh, there's actually some things that I can improve. And then obviously like I don't, I, there are things that, 
your clinicians are going to catch that I'm not going to catch. And that was really helpful for me. Um, I think everybody needs extra support and being able to see my numbers and see how they shifted in those couple of months in between taking my blood draws and seeing like, okay, certain things that I'm implementing are actually working was really, really helpful for me. That's awesome. Yeah, that yeah. feedback is incredibly powerful. Um, I think that the wins are important and also to see where, and as we've talked about, not everything is the same. So I always tell people that three month follow-up is so important because we can really see if it made a difference or not. And if not, then we move on to the next thing. If so, then we kind of continue that path and, and strengthen that habit. Yeah. Um, and so I'd love to kind of get into some, some stuff that people could take home with them too. Um, I know one thing that you spend a lot of time educating on is the food industry. So I'm curious to hear about kind of what you're seeing happening in the food industry and what's kind of the number one thing that you want people to kind of take away um, that they can use in their own lives. So I would say the number one thing that everybody needs to understand is that food is made with dollar signs in mind, not the health of the people. There is a very common misconception. I see comments all the time on my reels of people saying, well, if, it, if, this, if this was actually the case, because um, I like to point out certain ingredients and say, you know, these are not gonna be great for your health. Somebody will write and they'll say, well, then there's no way that they would put it on the shelf. The FDA themselves has admitted that they don't have the manpower to oversee all of the ingredients that, that are being put on our shelves. Right now, it's up to the food manufacturers themselves to submit paperwork to the FDA to prove that the ingredients that they wanna use are safe. So the fox is guarding the hen house in this case. And again, the FDA does not have the manpower to oversee all of the different ingredients that are coming into our food system right now. So unfortunately, just because it's on the, state, on the shelf does not necessarily mean that it's been vetted and safe. And the reason why this is, is because these large corporations, so there's 11 companies that own the entirety of our food system right now. They're lobbying in Washington because they wanna get the politicians on their side to get certain policies in place so that they can continue to sell these foods. Um, they are spending millions of dollars on marketing budgets to con confuse the public because look, the more confused we are about what to eat, the more money they're going to make off of us. They have food, they have in-house food flavor scientists that are creating these food like products to be more addictive because the more that you eat them, the more you're going to buy them. I mean, we, I feel like we all know that sensation of opening a bag of chips and you just feel like you cannot stop eating them. It's because those foods were literally designed to be overeaten. And so I like to remind people that it's not your fault. These food like products are literally overriding your own biology. We have certain, we have hunger cues, uh, leptin and ghrelin that tell us when we're hungry and they tell us when we're full. But these chemicals in these food like products are hijacking our brains and they're not telling us when we're full. So it's a perfect example of everybody knows, like I just said, the Doritos. Like, let's say you open a bag of Doritos, you feel like you just cannot stop eating them. You can eat a whole bag and not feel full. Who is binging on salmon and feeling like they can't stop eating salmon, right? Like there's a certain point where you like hit a threshold and you're like, okay, I'm nourished, I'm full. That's because that's real food and it's not hijacking your own brain's chemicals to tell you whether or not you're full or not. Right. And so that's really what I want people to understand is that we have to be our own advocates. We can't just trust that just because it's on the shelf that it's safe. It's on us to educate ourselves and know how to navigate the food system, knowing that there's some, there are some products that are just not gonna be great for our health. Yeah, um, and I think the other tough thing is that, just like you spoke to, these companies have huge budgets and you know, fruits and vegetables don't really have lobbyists in Congress. So that's why we need people like yourself educating, kind of being the voice for those things because nobody's kind of glamorizing carrots. Um, <laughs> And so exactly. it's easy to be able to kind of expose some of this because they have a big budget and, and there's not a financial interest on the other side. Um, so I'm really glad that you've kind of taken the time to really kind of advocate for this pattern, which again, I think is simple and works for a lot of people. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, and so digging in a little more into some specifics. So we also hear a lot about kind of foods we should consume more of, foods we should eat less of, foods we should avoid. Um, there's a lot of noise out there on social media and other places. Um, even experts or professionals sometimes disagree. So how do you walk people through navigating the current kind of foods industry and, and or food selections and how, what to stock, what to, to stay away from? So I always ask people, what are the foods that we have been eating since the dawn of time? What have humans been eating, eating forever? That's first my gauge as to whether or not I believe it to be healthy. 
So look to what our grandparents ate. What would be foods that your grandmother would recognize as food? And then as far as like navigating the actual grocery store, I have two rules that I go by. I mean, they're, they're rules, but they like help me really understand whether or not it's healthy or not. First and foremost, if it was once alive, it's fair game. You can apply that to plants, animals. If it was once alive, that would be considered something that's real food, whether it was growing in the ground or if it was like an animal protein. And then the other one is, now I'm, I also consider myself a realist. I live in the real world. I don't, I'm not expecting everybody to go grow all their own food and live off the land. Like I know that we have to buy stuff in packages. So my rule around that is when you read the ingredients on the back, if you recognize every single one of those ingredients and you could physically buy each of, the, of those in the grocery store, then that would be something that would be fair game. So like, for example, if you're picking up, um, I don't know, like tortilla chips and it's just like corn, oil, salt. And obviously there's certain oils that you want to avoid, but like, just think about the simplicity of it. Then I would say that that's fair game to buy. And that would be something considered minimally processed. When you start looking at things that have like DHT in it, for example, that would be something that would be considered ultra processed. And also you're going to look at that label and go, where in the grocery store am I going to find this? Like, where is somebody buying DHT? That's usually a sign that you want to put it back on the shelf. So that makes it really simple. Yeah. And I, I think that something else I try to tell people to do is um, this can feel very overwhelming, right? Even with a background in this, I think that when you start looking at your cabinets and seeing what's in there, it can feel very overwhelming. And so um, I try to recommend people just pick a couple things at a time. You know, next time you go to the grocery store, pick a couple things that you want to kind of, or that you maybe consume more of, whether it's a bread product or a cracker or a cereal, and really kind of start reading labels. Because just like you're saying, you can't really trust the food industry too. They love to slap labels on there like natural. Um, and it doesn't really, it doesn't mean anything. Organic has um, some meaning behind it and is regulated, but things like natural just isn't. And so people kind of often see these labels, these health terms, these buzzwords, and think that it's healthy and that the food industry, industry is looking out for you, but you can't really trust it. You have to go to that nutrition label, yes. which can be pretty complex and you have to start decoding it. And so I, I like to have people just kind of work through some of that and find a couple brands that you like in that section. So crackers or cereal, and then you've got your brands and then you move on to another food wow. the next time. And so that way you really start kind of doing a clean out and also just looking to see where you can substitute, just like you're saying, where can you shift something maybe not from buying it processed or prepackaged and having it in a whole foods form. Um, but it is a journey. And so, I'm, you know, I don't know about Courtney, but I am still on this journey um, and it takes time and it's worth it. Um, but don't get overwhelmed with kind of when you open up your cabinet, how much in there is possibly ultra processed. Just start somewhere and, and work from there. Yeah, I do want to say one more thing too, as far as like actually what foods like maybe somebody personally should not be eating versus what they should be eating. I always encourage people to always take note of how you feel after mm -hmm. eating something, because there are some foods that may just not jive super well with you. Like I know people that can't really eat avocados because whenever they eat them, they don't feel very good. Perfect example for me, oats, objectively, a very healthy food. Uh, I would say one thing with oats is that you want to buy organic glyphosate free because the non-organic ones are, um, they're finding a lot of glyphosate on them. That's another conversation. But my point is that like oats objectively are healthy. I avoid them for the most part because I don't feel good when I eat them. Mm -hmm. So I would just, I would encourage people to start taking notes of the foods that you're eating and by no means like become obsessive about it. Cause that's the last thing that we want people to do is like have an unhealthy obsession with their food but it's learning to become more intuitive and more of an intuitive eater. Or if you eat something and you're like, you know what, that actually didn't make me feel that good. So maybe next time, instead of oats, I'm going to do quinoa or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you touched on that. Cause I think intuitive or like mindful eating is such, we're also hearing more about that. And I think it's such an important practice um, that can really help to cultivate a kind of more true relationship with your food. I think yeah. a lot of people, especially, um, you know, grew up in that clean plate club, um, dessert only if kind of situation. And so we've developed some relationship around our food that isn't always just based on enjoyment and satiety. Um, and so intuitive eating and mindful eating, and you know, we'll have to have Courtney back sometime because it's a whole another yeah. podcast. But there's yeah. some great information about there around that. And I think it can really help to kind of restructure that relationship so that you trust your body to tell you, you have to give it time to listen first, just like you're saying. We have to be paying attention and be mindful of what our body's saying about types of food and also amount of food. So we have to kind of reform or strengthen that relationship so that we are kind of communing with what we eat 
three times, three to five times a day. Um, or maybe people fasting one to five times. Yeah. Um, so well, and I, I think if we encourage people to really get in touch with what makes them feel good, it helps them navigate online better and understand what information is for them and what information is not for them, you know, because there is a lot of noise online. I mean, we have people saying, only eat meat, all fruits and vegetables are unhealthy for you. And then we have, you know, another camp saying, all meat is bad for you, only eat fruits and vegetables. And so it's like, we need to learn discernment and learn what makes us feel good in that container of real food. I would argue, the science says the same, ultra processed foods, not good for us. I would argue that they're not, they're not even food. I, I call ultra processed foods Play-Doh. Some people eat it, but you're not really supposed to. <laughs> It's like kids eat play go, but like you shouldn't be eating it. Um, but in the context of real foods, nothing is off the table unless if it doesn't make you feel good. So if you go in with that mindset and somebody is doing a video and they're saying, you know, X, Y, and Z, or X, Y, and Z vegetable is bad for you, mm -hmm. I would take a step back and go, mm, well, that's a real food. So I'm going to see if my body does well with them. And if it does, then keep eating it. Oh. And that's how you really like have discernment. I love that. That's such a nice, easy takeaway for people. And again, personalized and individual. Yeah. Nobody's yes. going to do um, So as you said, Courtney, I could probably go all day doing this, um, but we, <laughs> again, we want to leave a little space for questions. So as we wrap okay. up, um, Courtney, we are going to do three health non-negotiables, but maybe give me your top one or two daily health non-negotiables for, for your life. Okay. I would say sleep is absolutely number one. Maybe like the most boring, but sleep. Sleep is absolutely imperative. Um, obviously for your brain, but also just for your diet. Like I'm sure everybody knows what it feels like to be on like two hours of sleep. And then you're just craving all of the, just like high sugar, you know, high fat stuff all day. Cause your body's looking for energy. Um, and also just, you know, it helps with brain health. It helps me feel better. And we're just all the science coming out about how imperative sleep is for us. So I would say sleep. Um, Oh, I have to pick three sleep <laughs> movement is incredibly important to me. And by movement, I mean getting out in nature, getting vitamin D from the sunlight. Um, it's bonding time with my dogs. It's me time for myself, moving my body. Um, and then I would say the last thing is eating real food. Love it. Um, brings everything together. And, and they really are multiplicative. None of them exist in a vacuum. We need all of them to yeah. kind of feel our best. Um, awesome. Well, mine were very similar. So sleep it. was the top of mind. I feel like I did not respect that when I was younger, but I have come to have a very respectful relationship with sleep um, with the caveat that I have two young kids and sleep is not always only in, in my purview. Um, I'm not the controller of all of my sleep. And so <laughs> I do what I can and I've um, really restrict kind of um, screen time around sleep. And so I really try not to use it an hour before bed and within the first 30 minutes of waking because that part I can control. And so at least I'm kind of limiting that exposure. And then I just prioritize it when I can. Stuff has got to fall off in order to, to get sleep yeah. um, because it really does, like you said, cascade into everything else. Um, and then food, of course, is my other big one. I've always has been, you know, big passion of mine. Um, and then my health kind of maybe reach um, is I'm working on mindfulness. So um, <clears throat> trying to be mindful, like spending a few day, few minutes each day, just like playing with my kids rather than running the to-do list in my head. And so trying to just be present um, when I'm walking the dog or just in, in those little moments, just being present, enjoying the food I'm eating rather than rushing through it because um, someone's going to throw a tantrum. So trying to really cultivate that. But that is definitely kind of, again, that journey piece that, that I'm on. Um, I love so <laughs> let's jump into a few questions. So okay. one that I thought was... Um, do you have tips for eating healthy while traveling or eating away from home? Ooh, I'm like, how much time do we have? Um, before <laughs> I went back to school and got my master's, I was working as a nutritionist on the road for a pop star. Um, I worked in music for 10 years on the road, and so I was traveling a lot. Um, I would say my top tips are always be prepared. Um, so it depends on the type of travel that you're doing. For example, whenever I'm flying or whenever I'm driving, I always bring meals with me. Because if you don't prepare that, then you're gonna be scrambling and you're gonna end up with fast food or you're gonna be starving. Um, so I always pack meals with me in like a little cooler bag, which I actually fly, I do videos about this all the time because a lot of people don't know you can do this. I bring a little cooler bag with an ice, a frozen ice block in there and a meal. As long as it's frozen, TSA lets you bring it through. So that's what I do so that I can avoid because airport food is for the most part pretty nasty and it's also expensive. 
it's expensive and it's not that great. Um, so that's what I do as far as like flying and driving. Now, if I'm on a vacation, um, I generally, I look for healthier spots if I can. Um, so my keywords that I search for in like Google maps will be organic food or I'll search vegetarian food. I'm not even vegetarian, but oftentimes if you search vegetarian, um, it'll bring up the like healthier, like juice spots and stuff like that, or I'll type in grass fed, um, organic, like I said, and then that usually will help me find healthier for you restaurants. Now, let me say one more thing on this piece. I think everybody thinks because of my online persona and everything I talk about online that I'm way more insane and strict about my food than I actually am. Um, I am not as strict as everybody would think that I am. I tell people all the time, I'm like, control the controllables, control the things that are coming into your home, buy healthy groceries, um, really be on your eating when you're at home because you know what you're buying, you know what the ingredients are in there. And then if you're gonna go out to eat with friends, enjoy yourself. Don't be so worried about all the ingredients and all the different oils and everything. Now it's a different story if you're eating out every single night. But if you're like me and you're on a vacation for a week and you're, there's, there's nothing you can do about it, I'm not gonna be bringing my salads with me to dinners with friends. Mm -hmm. That's just not, I think that there's a balance that needs to be had because your mental health is also incredibly important. If you spend all your time stressing and in, in anxiety about it, you're, it's gonna be just as unhealthy for you. And there's a lot of studies that show that if you are um, eating with friends and you're having fun and you're laughing, like the food has a different impact on your body. Yeah. So just remember that and try to give yourself some grace. And again, I really try to find healthier for you restaurants, but if I can't find them or if I have friends that are like, I really wanna to go to this place, great, I do it. I don't think twice about it. I eat the food, I move on with my life. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's such a great tip. Um, one other thing too that I think can help with travel is in you know this world of Airbnb and VRBO, I think, um, getting a place that has a kitchen can be really helpful because yes. um, oftentimes they're, you know, going to the grocery store and simply stocking up. Um, and we always kind of bring, if we do a road trip, travel with like breakfast items. So we're always making, um, see, this is where we're the, the opposite. Um, we're a big oatmeal family and so I'll always bring the oatmeal. So I know oh, that I great. have oatmeal, berries, nuts in the morning. So we've got a healthy staple. And then if we have something else later on, um, I feel like it has less of an impact because you have kind of an anchor, something you already started your day off with that you know works for your body. So um, I think having a kitchen can be incredibly helpful um, or bringing something that you know works for you and your family. Um, but that's I love really that balance thing. idea. I think that's so, so important in life. You got to enjoy. Um, one other question, if Courtney will allow us. Yeah, um, let's do it. So this one is a little bit of a can of worms as well, but um, let's touch really briefly on gut microbiome. Again, this could be a whole nother video, um, but obviously there's a lot of research coming out. So it says, how should we be thinking about healing our gut microbiome? Oh my, oh my gosh. I mean, yeah. this, I feel like there's a lot we have to say. So I, I would say first and foremost, I would encourage everybody to get a GI map test done because you can't, similarly to what we were saying earlier about the blood work with Life Force, you can't just be throwing things at your gut, taking probiotics, whatever, if you don't actually know what the terrain looks like in your gut. So I would encourage using that as a jumping off point, just to give an example in my own experience. Um, my diet has been pretty dialed in for a long time and I consider myself to be pretty healthy. And I got a GI map done last year and I had H. pylori, staph, strep, and high candida. And so, and I, I had no symptoms. I had no, I, I was just going about my day being like, I'm, you know, pretty healthy. Um, so just to give you guys an example of, you could still be doing all the right things and may not even know that you have an underlying pathogenic overgrowth happening. So I would start there. Um, I would also focus on fermented foods because we know that those feed the good, or the good bacteria in the gut. Also just getting an array, a rainbow of all different kinds of foods if you can, like fruits and vegetables and everything. We know that that's really good for the microbiome because it feeds the microbiome and it wants a variety. Um, that's, that's what I would say on that without having to dive yeah. more deeper into it. But. Love it. Yeah. I mean, it really goes back to eat real food. Yeah. There's fiber in most of that and um, you're going to be feeding your gut microbiome. So I love that you did that in about 90 seconds. That was an incredible, <laughs> incredible thing. Thank you. Everybody, I would love to thank Courtney for being on. Um, if anybody out there is also interested in learning more about their nutrient levels and working with kind of a personalized team approach to really 
achieving your optimal wellness, whatever that means to you, um, Life Force clinicians are here for you and the whole Life Force team. So if you want more information, go to mylifeforce.com slash live. That link will be in our bio as well as Courtney's. Um, and of course, if you have questions, feel free to send them to the Instagram Go Life Force. Um, we would love to have you join us and um, be a part of this incredible movement that is so important for all of our health and well-being. Yeah. So thank, thank you, so Courtney. For me. Thank you for working through the tech issues and for sticking with <laughs> us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, and thank you guys so much for tuning in. Appreciate you guys. Of course. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Hope to talk you to you too. soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.